So I want to begin this morning uh, by talking about something that I think is challenging for us, uh, I would say those of us who have had children. Uh, one of the challenging things, really the first thing that is a difficult thing is to pick a good name. Naming kids, it, it's just it can be uh, a lot of pressure. Uh, for us, we had it easy with the first two, okay? So with James, it was fairly easy because uh, in the Greek tradition, you name your firstborn son after his grandfather. So we named him James after my dad, and that worked out well. Don, my wife, is like, okay, James is fine. So that, that was good. Uh, ben was also fairly easy. At, that, that was her choice, kind of my pick, then her pick. And I liked the song, Benny and the Jets. So I was like, that Ben is good, right? That that's should be a good one. But we did get stuck a, a bit with Caleb. Uh, and that's because we got it into our head that uh, we liked the name Matthew. And, and we said, look, there's lots of families where the, the dad and some of the kids are, have the same name, and it's not a big deal. Uh, George Foreman, for example, as you might know, has like four sons. They're all named George Foreman. George Foreman Jr., George Foreman III, George Foreman IV, fifth. I think there's six of them. And even his daughter is named Georgetta. So we thought, look, yeah, one extra Matthew in the house is not that big a deal. So that was our plan. We told everyone. The thing is, when Caleb uh, arrived and we started to try to call him Matthew or Matt Jr., it just felt weird, you know? Like, I was there, he was there, we didn't know who you we were talking to, and so we backed out. We, we said, no, we're not going to do this. I had to text everyone, sorry, we don't know who this is, we don't know his name. Uh, we felt like horrible parents uh, right away because it's tough. You don't, you don't want the wrong name. You don't want a name that's going to, you know, stick with you or... I say that because uh, in our text this morning, there are two very surprising baby names, names that no one would ever name their children, and yet God uh, instructed his prophet to name these names of, of his children. So if you were here last week, you know we're in the book of Hosea. Hosea is a prophet of God. Uh, God had a word for his people about their sin, about their unfaithfulness, and, but he didn't just want the people to hear the word, he wanted them to see it. And so his instructions to Hosea were, uh, I want you to go and marry a woman of unfaithfulness. A woman of whoredom was the way that it was phrased, uh, because I want to say something to the people about their unfaithfulness. And so that's what, that's what Hosea did. Last week we saw he married a woman named Gomer, probably a local prostitute. And then God said to them, and if you have kids, I, I have some names for you. So the first one last week was Jezreel, which is kind of a bit of an odd name, but had very negative connotations. Today we're going to see the next two children. And we're going to see the names that God had picked out for these kids, and they're very interesting. So uh, we're going to start with just the first couple of verses, verses 6 to 8. Here's the beginning of God's word to us this morning. She, that is Gomer, his wife, she conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name No Mercy, for I will, have, uh, not, I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or horsemen. When she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, call his name, not my people. For you are not my people and I am not your God. So those are the names. You can imagine that baby announcement. Uh, clearly, clearly God still is wanting to get uh, the people's attention. He still clearly has a word for the people about the dangers of their unfaithfulness, about the reality of sin. And so here's how we're, we're going to begin this morning. There's just two points, but the first one is this. Sin severs our relationship with God. Sin severs our relationship with God. So let's look more closely, because I, I believe we see this here in the names that, that God has given to Hosea and his family. First name is No Mercy. In the original language, it was Lo Ruhama. Uh, which could also be translated unloved or no compassion. Now, you have to understand, back in that culture, it was a different, different culture. Kids were not coddled the way they are today. Uh, they didn't have helicopter parents. Uh, they, they, they had their kids working early. Life was difficult. There was expectations that kids would just be tough early on. But even in that culture, uh, this name would have been very strange. <laughs> would have been very surprising. No mercy. Now, it would, have, it would have drawn a lot of tension to the family, which, which was the whole point. If you think about it, um, you know, probably two years ago, 
by this point, was when Hosea would have gotten married, and that caused a lot of attention, right, to be to marry Gomer, and then they had a child, and that name caught a lot of attention, but now it's probably been a year. And even strange things, we get used to them. So probably the people in the, in the town, they would have just gotten used to Hosea and Gomer and Jezreel and just that the message that God was trying to communicate kind of would have worn off. But now there's another child and another strange name. You can imagine in the marketplace, oh, Hosea, who have you got? Is that your little girl? Oh, what's her? She's so cute. What's her name? Oh, her name. Yeah, we're just, we're just calling her No Mercy. Sorry, what was that? Well, or, or unloved. Uh, whatever you would, that's a nickname for her, no mercy, unloved. You can imagine the response. It would have got people talking. And there would have been a lot of assumptions, probably. You can understand why people would say to themselves, look, I know, you hear about the name? I know why he named her that, right? Because who knows? Like, is that really his daughter? I mean, how could he actually love her? Look, with who he's married to. I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's why he, he said no mercy to his daughter. How else could he say it? If Hosea had overheard that, he would have had a pushback. He would have looked them in the eye and said, listen, just so you know, this name, this name isn't about me. It's not about my family. This is about you. You are the ones who are not going to receive mercy. God is saying to you, you are rejected. You will not receive love because of your sin, because of your unfaithfulness. Just think about the weight of those words for a moment, how people would be kind of shocked by that, how it would impact them. To, to hear that they were not loved, that they would not receive mercy from God, from, from their father, the one who had made them a people, the one who had said to Abraham, look, leave your, leave your homeland, go to the place where I'm telling you I'm going to make you a nation. And then God showed them love so many times. He rescued them from Egypt. He provided for them in the wilderness. He pledged himself to them in covenant love, gave them everything they needed. And now, now his message to them was, listen, I, I don't love you anymore. Okay, he says it straight up in verse 6. I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. He's saying, don't expect any kindness. Don't expect any, any compassion. Whatever trouble you get into, it's on you from now on. That would have been totally shocking. And it, and it got worse. Because the next year, Hosea had another child, a son. And the name was even more explicit. The, the, the judgment of God, the severing of the relationship because the name was not my people. Uh, in the original language, lo ami, not my son, is another, is another way of interpreting that. So there again, you can imagine people talking, right? Well, I, I mean, it, he's saying not my son, not my people. Clearly, this is an illegitimate child. I mean, it must be, Hose, it must be Gomer, she's sleeping around. I mean, that's, that's what this is about. But again, that wasn't what this was about. Hosea and Gomer, they were just the messengers. The message itself was directed at the people, which was very obvious when Hosea communicated the word from God because the, the wording was a reversal of the wording that God had used to bring his people to himself. All the language that he spoke about the people was, was the opposite. So for example, in Exodus chapter 6, this is where um, the Israelites are in slavery in Egypt, and God says to Moses, okay, you're going to go and get them out, and Moses says, okay, uh, but who do I tell them is, is getting them out? Like, who, who are you to them? And here's God's answer, Exodus 6, 6. Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. This language is, is spoken over and over again to the people of God. God says, you will be my people. I will be your God. It, it's foundational to the relationship, the covenant that is there between his people and God himself. He's committed to loving them and being there for them and providing for them. And now he's abandoning them. You, you could imagine in the minds of the people, just the utter shock. Just like, I don't, how, how is this happening? Like, what? What is going on? Now, the specific answer to that question is that the people of God had turned their backs on God for a long time. They had not been acting like the people of God. But the general answer is that this is what sin does. 
This is, this is what sin, this, this is the effects of sin on relationship. Unfaithfulness, betrayal, sin, it always tears people apart. We can see it in our relationships. It's very clear. You think of a marriage relationship, you have two people who have committed themselves to each other. Husband and wife stand there, beautiful clothes, beautiful setting, all their friends and family before God. They speak vows to each other. I, I'm keeping myself only for you, is what they say. Right? Till death do us part. You and I, we're, we're united, we're bonded. There'll be no one else. And, and from that covenant, from those vows, they build intimacy over the years. They have ki- children together. They, they support each other. They sacrifice for each other. Build a life together. And the bond seems unbreakable. But of course, we know it isn't. We know that, that sadly, at times, there is a wife that finds out, or a husband that finds out, that their spouse has been unfaithful has been cheating on them. And in that moment, everything changes about that relationship. Once that happens, once the, the understanding is there that it's been, it's been years or whatever it's been, everyone, everyone understands if the, if the wife who knows, his, knows her husband's been cheating, if she treats him differently now. No one's that surprised if he comes home one day and all of his stuff is on the lawn and the locks are changed. She takes off the ring. She stops calling him her husband because every, everything is different. He's been unfaithful. He's sinned against her. He's broken the covenant, destroyed the relationship. This this is what sin does. Not just in marriage, but in every human relationship. Best friends can be torn apart by betrayal, by a hard-heartedness. Children and parents can be torn apart by by sin, by some manner of abuse or harshness or whatever it might be. This is... This is what happens. Sin is the knife to the heart of any relationship because at that moment, trust is gone, intimacy is gone, and the result is is a separation, which is exactly what happened between God and his people. They had turned their backs on him over and over again over the years, and so now he was saying, fine, fine, have it your way. Okay, you you are no longer my people. You're just a people. There's all these people, all these different nations, that, that's what you're like. There's nothing special between us anymore. This, we need to understand, these are the fundamental consequences of sin. Okay, there's a lot of consequences, but this is right at the heart of it, that it separates us from our creator. It separates us from God. That's what we see in the garden. Adam and Eve, they sin, they disobey, and almost right away, they are cast out of the garden. They no longer have access to their creator. There's, there's no longer any real connection between them and God, which, which is substantial. It's, it's definitive. It's, I mean, it's horrendous, but, but I think if you're, like if you're here this morning and you wouldn't consider yourself to be a Christian, I could, I could understand at first how you're like, look, I don't, I don't really see that as being a big deal for me because you know, being separated from someone who you don't quite know exists, or if they exist, it's not high on your list of problems. And so for many human beings in the world to hear about the, the, you know, as Christians, we talk about the consequences of sin and all of the the horrible, you know, impacts. This is one of them where I think many people are like, I don't, I'm not really sure why that is that big a deal. But let me say this. Just because you don't believe in God doesn't mean that you haven't experienced the impacts of being separated from him. In fact, I, I would say what we're seeing here in these, these strange baby names that God is giving to Hosea and speaking to the people, what we see here is him describing not just the consequences of Israel's sin. This is something we all experience as human beings, regardless of, of where we are on the, the faith spectrum. So let me just sort of show you what I mean. Uh, the first name, for example, no mercy, lo ruhama, no, no love, no compassion. You might say, look, that, I'm not sure how that affects me. This is, this is God supposedly speaking to these people long ago, and he, their, their relationship is changing. That's, I can see how that's bad for them, but, but how does it affect me? And I would say it does affect us because as human beings, don't we struggle with a sense of being loved? Like if you think about some of the, the deepest motivations of our heart, the longings of our heart, is, is that not what we are searching for as human beings? A sense of love a sense of compassion, a sense of, of connection. This is one of the things 
that we see on, on multiple levels in human culture, that we are seeking to connect with others, friendships, dating relationships, marriages, but also in a deep way, we really long to be understood, long to be loved, affirmed, have that affection. And if we don't get it, we're crushed. It breeds a lot of fear in us that maybe we won't ever really be loved the way that we feel like we need to be loved. Uh, there's, a, there's an article uh, years ago. I was in a, uh, I think, doctor's office. I was reading uh, Harper's Bazaar, which is a magazine I don't usually read, but it's all there was. And uh, there was an interview with the actress Demi Moore. And uh, I was just reading through it, and one of the questions they asked was about her fears. And her answer just jumped, jumped out at me. I've, I've always remembered it. I've kept this quote. I might have even shared it before. But here was her response to that question. She said, what scares me is that I'm going to ultimately find out that, that at the end of my life that I'm really not lovable and that I'm not worthy of being loved, that there's something wrong with me and that, it wasn't, that I wasn't wanted in the first place which is just a very honest and vulnerable answer, and I appreciate that. But also, I think it's not something that just Demi Moore has experienced. I think all of us wrestle with this. I think this is why we end up in relationships that are not healthy for us. It's because we would prefer to have that rather than having no one at all. We struggle, we, we fear not being wanted, not feeling like we're valuable because there's no one else in our life to love us that way. And it causes problems for us, this deep longing for love, because even the people in our lives who do love us, they, they usually don't love us perfectly or consistently. And so there's a lot of friction there. It, 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 it pushes our buttons at a very deep level when the people who say they love us disappoint us. And what we're seeing here in the book of Hosea is that none of this should be a surprise for us because our sin has severed our connection to the one who could love us perfectly. The Bible says that God is love. And in our sin, in, in us being separated from him, we are separated from the love that we truly need. It's, it's never enough. The people in our lives can never make that up. So even if we might not believe in him at this moment, we feel that sense of longing. It defines who we are as human beings. The second name, though, is also applicable for us. Lo Ami, not my people. Again, this seems like not something to do with us, right? This is for the Israelites. I mean, it's too bad. They lost their status as God's people. Uh, but what, how does that affect us? Well, here's how it does. God is saying to them, because of their sin, look, you no longer have a sense of identity in me. Okay, you have no anchor for who you are or who you belong to. And, and that, I think, strikes me as being very familiar for human beings. Because I think we wrestle with that as well. Aren't we, aren't we at various stages of our lives really struggling with a sense of identity or maybe our whole lives? Especially when we're young adults, right? Late teens, we're trying to figure out who am I? Trying to go out into the world, figure out what my life is about, uh, what I'm here for. We want to know who we are. And a lot of the time we feel lost and that comes back a lot of the times in midlife, right? And we feel like we need to buy a motorcycle or do something crazy just to, to have a sense of, purpose and, and vibrancy. And the whole time, really, the struggle is that, that we are untethered to anything substantial, which is because of our sin. Our sin separates us from the one who defines us, gives us an identity that will last. We don't really know who we are. And neither did the Israelites. All of a sudden, they were alone in the world, no security, no identity, no help in times of trouble. And if that was the end of the story, it would be the greatest of tragedies to think that these people who had everything, I mean, a, not just an association with the God of the universe, but a personal connection. I mean, he intervened for them in the most practical, supernatural ways. He listened to their prayers. He said, you're my people, right? They, they had a real sense of who they were, where they were going. They had an assurance of love, all of that. And they threw it all away because why? Of their corrupt and unfaithful hearts. They wrecked it. They ruined it. It would be the, the greatest tragic flaw. If that was the end, it would be a complete tragedy. But thankfully, thankfully, it's not the end. It's, it's not the end of the book. It's not even the end of the chapter. Okay, the very next verse, there, there's an about face that happens. We see that God's love is much deeper, much wider than our sin. And despite our wretchedly unfaithful hearts, his promises can never be broken. And that's because of his faithfulness and not ours. So here's our second point. Uh, 
Jesus brings restoration. Jesus brings restoration. And I'm not sure about you, but I love that word, restoration. In fact, I love any show, any time where they're restoring something, I want to watch it, okay? If it's like a house, I love it. It's like broken down, condemned, right, falling apart within 72 hours, a brand new house. Somehow everything's structurally good. All the wiring's been redone. It's amazing. It's a brand new coat of paint. You love it, right? It's just such an amazing thing. Same thing with cars. I can't work on cars at all, but I love seeing this rust bucket brought, new paint job. It's gleaming. I even love antiques. A credenza that's all broken apart, and then they somehow fix it and shellac it. They varnish it. They do something to it. And I'm like, man, that's so satisfying. So I, I just feel so encouraged that something old and broken can be made new. That, this is what we find in this text. That for all of the, the proclamations, the warnings of the severity of sin, the severing of the relationship with God, all the language that seems like it's done and never going to get better, in the very next verse, verse 10, there's the word yet. Yet. Oh, what a great word. It's saying even though all of this is true in some sense, yet... I'll keep going. The number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and they shall appoint for themselves one head and they shall go up from the land and great shall be the day of Jezreel. So this is, is a beautiful, complete picture of restoration for God's people. You see all the elements there that were lost are now regained. There's a, there's a restoration of identity. Okay, they were not my people. Now they're children of the living God. There's a restoration of unity. If you remember last week, at this point, uh, the nation of Israel is divided into two, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. They're always fighting with each other, fighting with everyone else. This is saying that the children of Israel and Judah will be gathered together. So it's unity and they have one head, a new king. And the restoration of hope and life they shall go up from the land is a reference to, to resurrection. Okay, there's a hope beyond even this life. And that uh, last little part, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Last week we saw that word was associated with a lot of negative things. But the meaning of the word itself is hopeful. It's, it's God plants. God brings life. And that's what this is saying. That there will be a, a way, a time in the future, when the people of God will one day be fully restored, which is fantastic and amazing. You can imagine the people, if they were actually listening to Hosea, their emotions would have swung into like deep despair at first. And then verse 10, oh, wait a second. Everything's going to be better. That's amazing. But there would be some questions, I think. Questions that uh, I think we and they would have, but also some that, that just we would have. The main question, I think, that people at the time would say is like, how is this possible? How could this happen? How, if sin is as bad as the Bible seems to say it is, how could you go from not my people to children of the living God? That's a big question. But the, the question that we, I think, only would have is, why should we care about this prophecy? Like, strictly speaking, this is a prophecy to the Jewish people about their relationship with, with God. So where do we fit in? Most of us probably are not Jewish, so is, is there hope here for us? Why, why should we care? So two questions. Uh, the first one is the how. And I thought the best way to answer this would be with a timeline, okay? I don't know about you. I love a good timeline. Uh, it helps to explain things, organize everything. And so we're going we're gonna to work through a timeline of when this prophecy was given and how it actually comes to fruition. How could they actually be the people of God again? So it's not to scale, just so you know. Okay, 750 B.C., uh, God warns his people through Hosea. That's where we are, okay? Hosea is saying, look, this is serious. You're unfaithful. There's going to be consequences. And God was not bluffing. Uh, in 722 BC, Assyria conquers the northern kingdom, okay? It's a massacre. It's horrible. It's the severity of judgment is just as God said it would be. That's the northern kingdom called Israel. But the Assyrians, you know, are encouraged by their success. And so they're like, well, let's go take the southern kingdom too, so a few years later, 701 BC, they try to conquer the southern kingdom. They surround Jerusalem. It's a walled city. Uh, they lay, lay siege to it. That's what they do a lot of the time, wait for the people inside to starve to death. But during that time, there's a bit of a revival inside the city. But those are still the people of God. The king Hezekiah, he, he leads his people. He prays to God 
for help and for mercy. Listen, listen to his prayer. Think of the heart behind this prayer. Isaiah 37, he says, Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand. Let all the kingdoms of the earth, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. So what he's praying is, God, look, all these other nations, they were destroyed, of course. They didn't have any real gods. They were just statues, big statues, little. They're made of metal and stone. They couldn't help them. But you are the God of, of the earth. You are our God. You're, help us, save us. You see the faith, the, 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 the sense of identity. We are your children. Please take care of us. And God responds in grace and love. In one night, the angel of the Lord comes and wipes out 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Everyone wakes up in the morning. The Assyrian generals look and they're like, I guess we got to go home. There's no, there's no more army. Okay, they are miraculously saved, which is amazing, but also a fulfillment of Hosea's prophecy. Do you remember what it said? The beginning part of our text, Hosea uh, chapter 1, verse 7. At first, you know, Hosea said to the northern kingdom, no mercy for you. But, verse 7, he said this, but I will have mercy on the house of Judah. And I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war, by horses or horsemen, which is exactly what happened. Okay, the people of, of the southern kingdom, they didn't pick up a sword at all. God just came and saved them. And so the response from the people was, wow, th yes, yes, you are God. This is great. There was a renewed sense of, of identity and faithfulness. And it was great for a little while. But like always, things began to taper off. Idolatry returned. The faithlessness of their hearts was revealed again. God sent more prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, to say, look, there's judgment coming. The cycle is continuing. You know what's going on? They didn't listen. And then in 586 BC, now Babylon, okay, new kid on the block, they come and they conquer the southern kingdom. Okay, they, they bring into effect the, the warnings of God where he said, look, you're, you're not going to be my people. I'm not going to have mercy on you. You're going to be on your own. You're going to suffer the consequences of your sin. That's what happens. They're, they're wiped out. Uh, the temple's torn apart. Uh, Jerusalem's burned. Every, the kingdom is gone. And the, the, any people that are left are brought into exile. And at that moment, just think for a minute, the people who could have remembered the prophecy of Hosea, they would have been like, this, this is what he was saying is going to happen. It, everything is lost. And they also probably would have been saying to themselves, but, but wait, what about... What about all those promises? Remember the promise of restoration? Like, what? I thought we were going to be like the people, like the sand of the sea. Where, where is, how is that going to happen? Everyone would have felt like either God was lying or we have no idea how this can be made right. What they didn't realize is that at that moment, there was still a remnant. There was still a faithful few. Isaiah talks about it in chapter 10. He says, in that day the day of, of judgment. In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. In truth, a remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. There's over 80 references to a remnant in the Old Testament that God would one day raise up. And so a remnant was basically a small group of faithful Jews whose hearts were truly turned to the Lord truly believed in God, and they were still his people. Uh, they weren't in Jerusalem anymore, though. They were in exile. They got taken away, and so they were faithful, but not in Jerusalem. We know some of their names, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these guys who were faithful even though they weren't there, and they longed to go back and for the, the people of God to be restored, for all the things that God had promised were to actually come true. And it did start to come true. In 538 B.C., King Cyrus allowed the Jews to return. Okay, they went back, and they rebuilt the temple. It wasn't as great as the first one, but it was still a temple. Then Nehemiah came, and they started to build the walls, and so they started to kind of cobble things back together. But if you went there at that time, I mean, they were happy to be back in Jerusalem, but it was, listen, it was no restoration of the kingdom. People wept when they looked at the, the temple at that time, thinking of how beautiful it was before and now what they, they had. They were still longing, like, when, when were all these 
promises of God actually come true, and they waited. And they waited for hundreds of years until finally the Messiah came. Jesus arrived, year zero, right in the middle, to 33-ish A.D. And, and with him, there was the heralding of angels. With him, there was a perfect life, lived in a way that we could not, sinless. With him, there was a ministry where he proclaimed, look, the kingdom is here. And then he went to the cross, and everyone thought all hope was lost, but then he was resurrected, and they realized that this was the answer. This is the thing that we've been waiting for. And as the apostles began to write about it, they made the connections. Here's how John describes Jesus' coming. He says this, He, Jesus, came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, that's the, the Jewish people, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see that language? Children of God. Yes, that's what we've been waiting for. Finally, how did it happen? Not through the lineage, Jewish lineage, not through raising up of an army, not through good works, but simply through believing in the name of Jesus. Why? Because, Because he's the answer to the severing that comes with sin. He's the, he's the way that we can be reconciled with God. The relationship that was lost is now regained through him. This is what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were, who were far off from God have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He who has made, uh, who was made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Paul's sentence structure just drives me crazy. So what he's saying is that in Jesus, we now have peace with God. It's what we truly need. On the cross, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced the severing of relationship times infinity for us so that now we don't have to be divided by this wall of hostility, the wrath of God for a sin. Now we can be brought near. Even though we have sin, why? Because it's been paid for, because it's been atoned for. So in Christ, we are loved. In Christ, We are adopted into the family of God. In Christ, the time of exile is over, not because of us, but because of him. And it's not just for the Jewish people. It's for all of us. This is why we should care. Because as John says in verse 12, to all who did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. This this is the restoration that Hosea was prophesying, that one day there would be a people, that it would be possible for us to be truly united with him and with each other. It's a beautiful story and a beautiful reality, but there are still some challenges. Some challenges for the people back then, of course, is that they didn't have the benefit of a timeline. So they, were, they received all these prophecies, all these promises, but they didn't know how it was going to happen. They simply had to trust, and they should have trusted in the nature and character of God. For us, we can see it now, We have the benefit of all of the revelation, but the challenge for us is whether we will actually receive him. See, I think the biggest challenge for us is that when we feel unloved, and we still do, or when we feel rejected, that we think that now defines us, that it still defines our relationship with God, that because something has happened in our life, because of the circumstances, we don't think of ourselves anymore as children of God. We feel estranged from him. We we forget. We forget all the work that God has done to preserve and protect his people over the years. And this has always been a problem for us, clearly. I mean, think of that that timeline. Think of how over the, the generations, God was always at work, showing love, orchestrating things. But think of the people's response. A lot of the time, it was still a hard heartedness, still a lack of faith. There were times where the people of God were throwing up their arms in anger, saying, God, why are you doing this to us? Why are you letting Babylon attack us? Why don't you love us anymore? And then there's other times where the people were full of despair because of their own sin. How could God ever love us again? The biggest challenge for us as God's people is that we tend only to look at us, at ourselves, and the circumstances of our lives. We forget to look at God and what it is that he's doing and has done. Because the truth is that God has always been at work in our lives, in history, so that there would be a true restoration and opportunity 
for reconciliation with God. The point of Hosea's message here in this passage is to warn us. There's a clear warning against the the consequences of sin, the tearing of relationships, certainly, but there's also the point of assuring us of God's love because it doesn't waver. To those who heard Hosea's message truly at the time, they would have been very comforted. They should have been comforted. Their sense of self and their sense of hope, they should have realized is always rooted in, in God himself and not in themselves, not in their circumstances. And this is, this is still what we need today. So let me ask you this. Do you, think, do you think God would do everything that he's done in human history? Like from the time of Hosea, through all of the events we saw in that timeline, to the restoration of God's kingdom, to the seed of faith planted in you if he wasn't going to keep doing that good work in you? Like do you think, do you think after working for thousands of years, to make a way for everyone to have peace with the Father, to, to regain our sense of identity and love, that then he would abandon you in your time of trial? Or that he would reject you because of your sin? The, the clear message of all of this, of the entire story of the Bible, is God's for you. He's for us. He loves us. In spite of our unfaithfulness, in spite of our hard-heartedness, in spite of even our, our sin, and even the way that he does it shows us the depth of his love. Because we could ask the question, God, if you were going to do all of that, why, why did it take so long? Like, why all the ups and downs? Why the adversity? Why the conquering? Why did, if you're going to restore people, why didn't you just do it right away? You could have done it right away. And the answer is because God doesn't just want a lot of children. He wants true children. He wants a, a children who understand the depth of his love understand the, the depth of our own sin and, and see the grace and love that he's shown, the power manifested throughout all these generations and in our lives so that we would then step forward with that same faith. This is, this is what he's saying to us in Scripture, that even now with whatever is going on in our lives, discipline, trial, adversity, it's not because we aren't his children. It's because we are his children. It's because he, he wants to shape us and mold us so that we would be truly restored, so that we would, we would shine brightly with the glory of God. God is at work, restoring his people, growing our faith. We're, we're meant to be encouraged by this and to encourage each other. The very last verse, which oddly uh, is the first verse of the next chapter, but sort of wraps up this whole section, is this. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy which is how we should be speaking to each other. Especially when there's someone in our lives who is feeling unloved, feeling rejected. Especially when there's someone who's feeling lost, just feeling like they, they don't know who they are. We, if they're a person of faith, we should be reminding them, look, you know who you are. You're a child of God. He loves you deeply. He's shown that to you. And if there's someone who doesn't yet have faith, we can say, look, I, I know God's love for you. Are you interested in knowing about what it, what it actually means to be his child? Because the way forward is, is one of grace that we need only receive, like acknowledge who Jesus is and our need for him. And then we can experience that love again in every area of our lives. So my hope is we'll take heart in this and that it will be a, a great encouragement for us uh, for today and for the rest of our week and going forward. So let me pray that for us as we close. Lord Jesus, it's an amazing thing to, to be able to see that you are the fulfillment of, of everything that was prophesied in the Old Testament. And yet, the challenge for us is so often we just, we don't, we don't really believe it, frankly. We, we live our lives as if we are um, still separated from you, from the Father. So I pray, please, that you would you would minister to us through this truth. Help, help us to, to understand ourselves and you and the Father, not, uh, not from the circumstances of our lives, but th through the revealed word of Scripture, that we can see clearly that, that God is a loving Father and that you, Lord Jesus, you came because you loved us, because you wanted to glorify the Father, you wanted to reunite us, to actually restore us as, as a people. 
And I pray that from that, we would just be filled with a sense of, of value and worth and love and that then we would have so much more to share with others. And we do pray, Lord, for the people in our lives. I pray those who are struggling with a sense of identity, a sense of love. I pray for Demi Moore. I pray, Lord, I don't know where she is at, Lord, but I pray she would know that she is loved, that she has always been wanted. And I pray the same for us. Lord, I pray the enemy would not succeed in, in deceiving us into thinking, Lord, that no one cares. I pray that we would be a people who are there to encourage each other with these kinds of truths, not just superficial, it'll get better, but a deep sense of, of knowing who you are and what you've done and what you, the plans you have for us. So I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to respond uh, together. If you're new here with us, 